After a seven-month, 119 million mile journey into deep space, Mars, the bloody beacon of our imagination, appears like a heavenly apple, ripe for the picking. Is there life here? What will it look like? Will we discover if we are alone in the universe or not? The question haunting all of mankind has finally driven us to Mars. But is it possible that we've already been here? at about 10 kilometers an hour. And the temperature's a balmy eight degrees, way up from last night's low of minus 200. It's a perfect day for a walk on Mars. In many remarkable ways, Mars is just like the Earth. A day here lasts 24 hours. And although further from the sun, it too has seasons. In the summer, Temperatures can reach almost 80 degrees, causing its polar ice caps to melt. But you wouldn't want to live here. The atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide and only one-tenth of a percent oxygen. Poison to life as we know it. And it appears to life here as well. Mars is half the size of Earth, but some geological features dwarf those on our planet. The volcano Olympus Mons rises 75,000 feet, two and a half times the size of Everest. And the Valles Marineris Canyon would stretch from Vancouver to Halifax, the longest of its kind in the known solar system. In 1965, we got our first good look at Mars. Mariner 4's grainy pictures looked positively moon-like. Meteor impact craters were everywhere. On later missions, intriguing evidence of dried up riverbeds appeared. Finally, in 1976, Vikings 1 and 2 landed on Mars, tested the soil, and found no organic material whatsoever. Yet even in its dryness, Mars betrays a watery past. In fact, everywhere you look, there's water. Or at least, there was. Geological formations suggest Mars was once a lot warmer and wetter, with an atmosphere much like Earth. The planet's reddish color is caused by iron-rich minerals oxidizing. In other words, rust. Mars is covered in it, we think leached to the surface by groundwater. So where did it go? Our best guess is that it's frozen at the poles, or hidden underground. For life as we know it, no liquid water means no life. But for scientists, no clear evidence of water is no good reason not to go. When we study uh, the possibility of life on Mars, we're really concerned about three major things. First of all, uh, could life have evolved independently on Mars? So in which case there are two types of life forms, one on Mars and one on Earth. Or did life evolve on Earth and then get transferred to Mars on bits of rocks thrown up by impact events. Another speculation, of course, is that life could have evolved on Mars and not evolved on Earth and actually been transferred to Earth on bits of rock, in which case we're all Martians. Since the dawn of human history, we've dreamed of Martians. The ancients associated Mars with war and chaos, unaware its bloody color was only the reflection of a very rusty world. With the invention of the telescope, we took a closer look. In the late 1800s, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli saw what he thought were man-made canals. In 1904, Percival Lowell, an American millionaire, 
seized on Schiaparelli's observations, sparing no expense to prove ingenious Martians were irrigating their drying, dying planet. It was one of the great wrong guesses in astronomical history. But Lowell and Schiaparelli did help launch a new century of studies and science fiction, inspiring the imagination of more than a few future scientists. Mars is the Rosetta Stone, letting us know whether life is unique to the Earth or a general phenomenon in the universe, and letting us know whether life as we find it on Earth is the pattern for all life everywhere or just one small part of a much greater tapestry. The challenge of our time is to, to go to Mars for the first time and to explore the place. And that's what it's about. It's about exploration. Going into the unknown, try to find out what's out there. Since we first realized Earth was not the center of the universe, we've scoured the skies for company, and so far, we've found absolutely nothing. On Mars, life seems impossible, or is it? On Earth, recent discoveries of organisms thriving in bizarre, hostile environments has given us new hope of finding life on the red planet. And if we do find it, odds are it's microscopic, at best, minute. But if it's unlike anything living on Earth, the impact will be gigantic. For now, Mars is the place for us to go. One thing we do know about extraterrestrial life, it is not conveniently located. And to find it, scientists have stopped going to Roswell. Instead, they go to the harshest environment on Earth. Hey, how you doing? I feel great. Good. I feel great. It's a good workout. Of all the places on our planet, Devon Island is almost the red planet. With one exception, here there is life. Yet for those who want to go there, Devon Island has become a natural launching pad for the journey to Mars. Located in Canada's high Arctic, 400 kilometers from the magnetic North Pole, Devon Island is the largest uninhabited island in the world. Most of it is barren, unforgiving polar desert. In the east lies a gigantic permanent ice cap, in the west, one of the largest meteor impact craters on Earth. Every summer for the past four years, an international team of scientists has been drawn here to the floor of the Hawken impact crater. For six short weeks, with 24 hours of daylight to help maximize their time, 
They've come to work with a single purpose, to go to Mars. Okay, Peter. Dr. Pascal Lee, a NASA planetary scientist, is project leader for the Houghton Mars project. The scope of the project is twofold. Science is about geology, biology, uh, life in extreme environments, uh, analog studies between valleys and canyons on, on Devon and, and those on Mars. The other aspect is exploration research. 626 Devon Crater, weather is 8 to 10 knots from the southwest across the runway, clear, good visibility. We thought, why not study at the same time how exploration is done and what it would take to send humans to Mars. It's just like planning a camping trip. You have to put together a plan that's well thought out. Uh, I often say that the void to Mars is the mother of all camping trips. For the 70 scientists and engineers who've traveled thousands of kilometers, hauling tons of equipment, telecommunications, fuel, and no portable toilets, this too is a mother of a trip. And now that they're here, isolated at the top of the world, everyone feels like an astronaut. In the lexicon of NASA, Devon Island is a Mars analog. Of all the environments that exist on Earth, this is the closest we can get to the climate and geography of Mars without going there. But for the Houghton Mars Project, Devon Island is Mars. Exobiologist Dr. Charles Coquel studies the origins of life in the universe. And since we haven't found any yet, He's come to Devon Island. We really have to constrain our search for life based on what we really understand and what we know. And that's why we come to a polar environment, because at least we know life can survive in this environment. And so if we go to Mars and look for similar types of life, at least we're on safe ground. It's something we understand and we know. And then if we get to Mars and we find that there are completely unknown forms of life there, then that's great. What kinds of environments are favorable to life? What makes a planet happen? What makes it hospitable to life, capable of evolving? And how will we survive in a completely inhospitable world? The natural history of this barren world may reveal secrets about the next one out. Devon Island is a Mars analog more than just from the standpoint of having an impact crater in a polar desert. It's also many valleys and channels and networks of canyons and, uh, and other valleys around the crater and throughout the land of Devon Island that bear astonishing morphological resemblances with Mars. Is it just a coincidence that the valleys on Devon Island and the canyons on Devon Island look like the ones on Mars, at least some of the ones on Mars, or is it is there something fundamental, a common underlying cause, a common underlying origin? Are the origins of life on Earth the same on Mars? To seek an answer to the question of the ages, we're drawn to Devon Island. And it appears we've come to the right place. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The surface of Mars is pockmarked with meteor impact craters. Meteorites are destroyers of life. On Earth, they wiped out the dinosaurs. But they also create life and are fundamental in a planet's evolution. Millions of years ago, a meteorite the size of Manhattan slammed into Devon Island. The impact was equivalent to a thousand megaton bomb 
destroying all life within a 150 kilometer radius and leaving behind a lake of molten rock 20 kilometers wide, which took 10,000 years to cool. Today what remains is the best preserved meteor impact crater on Earth. For scientists on the Houghton Mars project, they study the crater not for what it destroyed, but what it created. Once upon a time, Mars was a much different planet, and so was Devon Island. At the time of the meteorite impact, the climate here was a lot like southern Canada's is today, and the record of that ancient time can be found everywhere inside the crater. 23 million years ago, this place was very different from what it is today. It was a boreal forest, little animals roaming around the woods, like little rhinoceros, giant rabbits. And it is sort of interesting how uh, such a distant past can be preserved in, in rocks. Rocks are like books, they tell a story. And when we go to Mars, we will be faced with many rocks whose stories need to be read. A meteorite impact is like a nuclear steam shovel, digging up billions of years of history and in the process, creating a massive amount of heat, a key element in the creation of life. When an asteroid or comet hits the surface of the Earth, it sterilizes the area, nothing can live. And then things begin to change. We're standing at the edge of the Horton Impact Crater and we're standing here on a huge mound of impact breccia. This is the rock that fell back from the sky after the asteroid or comet hit the ground. And it's basically a molten pile of rocks that's fused together. The surface of Mars has been pounded by asteroid and comets for four and a half billion years. And so by beginning to study the biology associated with these unique impact rocks, we can help to refine our ideas about how we might search for life on Mars. There are certain habitats that exist which life will actually move into or colonize. Hydrothermal vents, created by a meteorite impact's extreme temperatures, are an ideal environment for life to begin. On Earth, it's possible that life was born in a place just like this. Hydrothermal vents are an extraordinary opportunity for life. In fact, they could, the word hydrothermal contains the two key ingredients for life, hydro, water, thermal, heat. Hydrothermal vents, for example, that are at the bottom of the oceans on the Earth, okay, where sunlight does not reach, still harbor life because they provide these two ingredients in particular. And the big question is, is it sufficient to just have heat and water and of course some basic chemicals around for life to, to evolve and start? You find life not exposed on rocks, but you find life inside rocks. You can pick up a rock here on the ground. It seems to be lifeless, but then you turn it over and there is green. Meteorites create more than just a hole in the ground, but the hole is important. In the aftermath of an impact, lakes form on the crater's floor. Ancient lake beds are like treasure chests, their secrets locked away until someone comes along with a key. Everybody here has Mars on the mind. You walk out on some of the planes up here, you take a look across it, and it looks like you're looking at a Viking or a Pathfinder mission image. And all you have to do is let, add a little bit of red, and you feel like you're right there. Just outside the crater's bowl, three kilometers from base camp, paleolimnologist Darlene Lim is searching for answers, buried for millions of years. Paleolimnology is the study of the history of lakes, and a person would want to look at the history of lakes if you're looking to solve issues like climate change, for example, because at the bottom of a lake, sediment accumulates, and that sediment tells a story, and what it tells you is whether or not that lake has been changing through time. 
One of the ideas is that Mars had lakes in its past. So here we are examining a lake in the extreme environment and taking a core, and the hope is that someday we'll be able to put a core down in one of the ancient lake beds on Mars and examine that sediment record and see what happened to it and understand the environment there. Like Earth, Mars has an ancient climatic history. It even has a climate today. Question is, did Mars once have a warmer climate, favorable to life? That answer may lie buried in its own craters. 23 million years ago, Devon Island was a different world with a very different climate. Three and a half billion years ago, so was Mars. On Earth, life has found incredible, if not impossible, ways to survive extremes of heat, cold, even meteorites. It's possible that same resilience existed on Mars. By studying these places here at Houghton Crater, we are strategizing for our search for life on Mars. Maybe we will find some of the fossil remains of the life that would have thrived in that little transient phase of, of uh, water richness and, and warmth. We don't know, and uh, uh, that's why we have to go. life to thrive in impossible conditions continues to surprise us. On Devon Island, life thrives in about as impossible an environment there is on our planet, and it helps convince us that life on Mars is very possible. Since all the conditions for life here exist there, Is it possible for life to spring in an environment that might have been cold all the time? You come to the Arctic and you realize that you find life everywhere. Even if Mars was cold throughout its history, by coming to a place like this, we realize that it doesn't preclude life from having started there, and therefore, we still have a chance for finding life on Mars. Our understanding of life on Earth tells us that really life needs two basic things. It needs uh, a source of energy, and it also needs a solvent for all those reactions to happen. In. And on Earth, that's liquid water. Uh, wherever there's liquid water, we generally find life. That's not always the case, but generally it's true. And so that's why we're so... Uh, compelled by the idea of life on Mars because we know it's a planet that once had liquid water. We also know it's a planet that has sunlight that can drive photosynthesis. Summer is an explosion of life in the Arctic lit by a sun that won't set for another two months. Over 180 bird species flock here to breed and feed incessantly on mosquitoes, the scourge of the north. Life seizes the moment to give birth and grow up quickly. Sooner than later, the Arctic will return to normal. For the muskox, the largest land animal in the Arctic and undisputed cold weather champion, summer is its least favorite season. This ancient, indestructible animal more mammoth than ox, is happier withstanding minus 40 degree temperatures and howling 100 kilometer per hour winds. To survive, it depends on the warmest coat in nature and its uncanny ability to eke out a constant food supply in the harshest environment on Earth. On the treeless barrens, where the food chain can barely gain a foothold, incredibly, this bull weighs in at almost a ton. The instinct to survive the Arctic is as important as the amazing physical adaptations of life in this impossible world. A red-throated loon 
has built her nest isolated on her own private island. But it's no defense from an airborne pirate. The Jager, once a gull, but now more like a hawk, has spied his lunch. Loons can swim and dive like seals, but like penguins, their webbed feet make them clumsy on land. The loon's only defense of her nest is to posture and scream in anger. Yagers are known as the thugs of the Arctic. Extremely aggressive, they're experts at surviving any way they can, even stealing food out of the mouths of other birds, or in this case, a loon's nest. But it appears that the loon's fierce maternal spirit is enough to save the day. The wolf spider, as its name suggests, also has fierce maternal instincts. It's too cold and windy up here to spin a web, so the wolf spider attaches its egg sac to the tip of her abdomen as she hunts the barons for food. The high Arctic is a natural case study in survival. And those who study extreme environments also thrive in places like this. But exobiologist Charles Coquel has another motive life on another planet. Exobiology is the study of the origin and distribution of life in the universe. Now, of course, we've never found life on any other planet, so it's really a science without a data point. And so we come to extreme environments like these to try and understand how life survives, with the idea of trying to look for life on places like Mars. In the early history of Mars, there was probably liquid water on the surface. And if there were lakes, it's lakes like these that we would expect to be similar to what might have existed on Mars. So by studying the type of life that exists in these lakes today, we could get ideas of how to look for life on Mars and the sorts of things we might expect to find. We probably won't find a miniature rhinoceros, but if there's water, there's a good chance we'll find something. Or will it find us? My own work focuses on cyanobacteria, blue-green algae. These are very primitive organisms, and we know from the fossil record that they were living over the surface of the Earth three and a half billion years ago. And that's the same time when there was liquid water on Mars. So if we had one planet, in other words, Earth, that was covered in life, and one planet, Mars, that was completely sterile, that would be incredible. And in fact, it would almost be a more incredible scientific discovery to find that there was never life on Mars at all. Is this what we'll find on Mars? Simple, single-celled, invisible to the naked eye, yet very alive? Impossible conditions for life does not mean life is impossible. And nature, at least the nature we know, remains mysterious on Earth and Mars. Life in the Arctic is brutal. Life on Mars is worse. But eventually we will go. Our thirst to explore makes us human and inspires us to take great risks. Round trip to Mars is a three-year journey into unimaginable, uncharted territory. And when we get there, how will we live? Robert Zubrin is president of the Mars Society, an international organization fixated on man's quest for Mars. Zubrin has spent three years working with NASA 
to come to Devon Island and build the first Martian home. What we're building here is a combination habitat, laboratory, and workshop with a similar architecture to the kind of module that would actually fly to Mars on the first human mission to Mars. And what this station will allow us to do is continue that exploration, but conduct it in the style that it would have to be conducted on Mars, under the same constraints. And by trying to actually do real field exploration under those constraints, we're going to butt up against the kind of problems that people are going to face in conducting real field exploration on Mars. Getting to Devon Island is tough enough. Delivering 10 tons of prefabricated Mars habitat is a mission that requires a lot more muscle. Four U.S. Marine para-drops are successful, but on the fifth, the parachute fails, damaging valuable equipment and the best laid plans of Robert Zuko. When our fifth para-drop failed, some people thought we'd have to stop. And I said, no, because we have people here on site to find a way around the problem, okay? And that's gonna be the difference. On a human Mars mission, the crew is gonna be the strongest link in the chain. On Mars, the closest hardware store would be 119 million miles away. On Devon Island, it doesn't get much better. Zubrin must salvage his damaged equipment before starting construction on a job that will now take more time and a lot more effort. Yesterday, we had one of our key tests, which was could we lift a 2,000 pound object, 24 feet tall, could we lift it straight up and moor it in place? We did. And what's happened today is we passed the second big test, which is can we lift up additional sections and make them and bolt them exactly to the ones already up? And now we've shown we can do that. So now we have to keep on going around in a circle and if our calculations are correct, it comes around in a circle, the two ends will meet, and we'll have a structure. The Mars Society isn't the first to call Devon Island home. There's over 4,000 years of human history here. But today, only ghosts remain. Dr. Robert McGee has studied the history of this unforgiving world for over 40 years. The first Inuit who moved from Alaska into Canada brought with them a, a very sophisticated maritime hunting technology based on hunting mainly the large bowhead whales, which are the biggest animals in the Arctic Sea. So they very rapidly developed an adaptation of the North Alaskan house. Uh, for rafters, they used the mandibles, so bowhead whales and which can be uh, rafted together to cover uh, these houses. Then the house would have been covered with walrus hide or maybe beluga hide, something fairly heavy and covered with turf and snow so you had no trouble keeping yourself sheltered from the Arctic winter. It took Europeans several centuries to learn how to survive in the Arctic, as well as uh, the Inuit. The first expeditions which came in the 16th century came in the summer. They planted uh, uh, corn and uh, beans and peas in the Arctic to see if it would survive. And when they were stuck here in the winter, they were totally finished. They just had no idea where they were. In 1845, Sir John Franklin left England in search of the Northwest Passage and sailed straight into a frozen hell. Blocked by winter ice, he landed on the southwest coast of Devon Island. Mysteriously, his crew soon began to die. In 1982, 
Forensic anthropologist Owen Beatty performed autopsies on the frozen remains of Franklin's men and found high levels of lead in their hair and fingernails. The source? A new invention he had brought with him, the tin can. Lead toxins from the solder binding the can together had leached into the food and slowly poisoned the crew. Franklin's expedition was doomed from the beginning. He thought he was well prepared for the Arctic, but never expected his own version of high technology would ultimately kill him. It's now day five for the Habitat construction crew. Lifting the one-ton panels with a damaged crane has slowed their progress and drained them physically. And now, finishing the job before the end of the short summer season has become a serious problem. But Zubrin knows leaving the unfinished structure exposed to an Arctic winter is not an option. Getting close. Almost there. Finally, all 12 wall panels are up, but now the two ends don't meet. After another solid 24-hour day, they solve that problem too. My legs are aching, my muscles are aching, my voice is shot, but I, I feel about as good as a man can feel. To go to Mars with current technology, it would take two and a half years in all. This may seem like an extraordinary amount of time, but, you know, in the 19th century, people took six months to sail from England to Australia. They did it all the time, okay? And many missions of exploration, like Lewis and Clark, were two and a half, three years long. People are capable of doing this, and we're capable of doing this. 150 years ago, that's what John Franklin said, too. And although the grave sites of his ill-fated crew are scattered across the Arctic, Franklin himself has never been found. Lost on Mars on Earth. For the spirit of adventure it kindles, Mars remains at the forefront of the human imagination and as our next destination. Someday, we will take a walk on Mars. We can only guess what secrets it will reveal. But for all the risks, there's no shortage of astronauts ready to accept the challenge of our lifetime. I think going to Mars is going to be an adventure, and it will have its risk involved with getting there. I think it would be extremely exciting if I had the opportunity to head to Mars. You know, I'm going to wait to see how the future unfolds. Mars is not the destination, it's the direction. For all the planets in our solar system other than the Earth, it's the only one that has on it all the resources needed to support life, and therefore someday a new branch of human civilization. For our generation, Mars is the new world. The conditions for life seem to exist on Mars. At the same time, it's a very extreme planet. There's possible uh, toxic chemicals in the surface soil of Mars. There's very high ultraviolet radiation. So ultimately, we don't really know how life would have coped with those extremes. And we can only really tell by actually going there and exploring the planet. Would I go to Mars? 
My toothbrush is packed to steal a line from a friend. I don't know whether we'll find life on Mars. I don't know whether we'll find past life or present life. I don't know whether humans will actually have a future on Mars. Some people believe that it's a human destiny to travel to other planets. I don't know. What I find most rewarding right now is to be part of the journey. Here we are on Devon Island, okay, one of the most barren places on our planet. It is by understanding the details of why this place might be like Mars and why this place is actually different from Mars, we will gain a better understanding of both Mars and the Earth. The unpredictable power of nature continues to humble us. We believe we can control it, even change it, until we're blindsided with new phenomena. 800 years ago, the Inuit on Devon Island, well adapted to the Arctic for over 4,000 winters, were surprised by a mini ice age. Unable to cope, they had to leave or starve. Since then, it has remained the largest uninhabited island in the world. The Mars we think we know seems incapable of sustaining life. We also know it once could, and for some unknown reason, lost it. Today, that mystery may also be solved right here on Devon Island. The high Arctic is the best place in the world to study global warming. Climate change is exaggerated at the poles, and in the last century, the average temperature has increased here by five degrees. At this rate, before we set foot on Mars, our own polar ice caps will melt for the first time in 23 million years, causing havoc on the entire planet. It's a real problem, requiring real answers. Over the past few years, we've begun to realize that there's actually an ozone hole opening up over the Arctic, which means that the levels of ultraviolet radiation here is increasing. And it's a result of the behavior of six billion badly behaved monkeys on the surface of the Earth. And all the work we do here will really help us not just to understand life in extreme environments, but the impact that humans might have on sensitive ecosystems like this. Mars doesn't have an ozone shield. We don't know if it ever had one. But if it did, when we do get there, finding out how it disappeared could be important. Until then, Devon Island is as close as we may want to get to Mars. Any closer, and we could become Mars on Earth.